This way I can get the information to you better. Disgust is considered to be one of the basic human emotions defined by a strong revulsion and desire to withdraw from an eliciting stimulus or event. Darwin noted this back in 1872. So he was the first person to note that disgust was a basic emotion. Physically, disgust is accompanied by a distinct facial expression involving constriction of the oral and nasal cavities. You know, and that's a really good way to insult someone, you know. All you have to do to really insult someone is make a disgust face at them or at something they said. They really do not like that. Because basically what you're saying is, you're kind of like a parasite or an infectious disease. <laughs> Evolutionary models of disgust propose that this emotion evolved to help us avoid contaminated or harmful foods or other potential sources of diseases such as sexual contact. In addition to its role in directly helping to expel harmful foods from the body, disgust also forms an important component of the behavioral immune system. The suite of psychological mechanisms that aid in the detection and avoidance of potential contaminants before they can make contact with the body. It means obsessive compulsive disorder. You know, people will touch something that they regard as contaminated and then rush off to wash their hands and wash and wash and wash. Like some of them will wash till they, the soap's gone, they'll have showers till they run out of hot water. Like they just can't stop. And that's part of obsessive compulsive disorder. It looks like it's a disorder of disgust, even though it's classified with the anxiety disorders. Harsh, inducing disgust responses, whether via a foul order, a disgusting work environment, or recalling a disgusting experience, leads individuals to assign harsher punishments to others who had committed moral transgressions. Ha, here's something else. So, so if, your judge is, if your judge is easily disgusted and you've done something relatively disgusting, or maybe if the courtroom doesn't smell so good that day, well then you're gonna end up in jail longer. It also, here's the worst situation. You go into court and you're applying for parole. Okay, and it's just before lunch and the courtroom doesn't smell good. It's like you're not going to get parole because hungry judges are much more likely to deny you parole and then, of course, judges who are sensitive to disgust are going to regard your moral transgression as harsher and you can prime that. And so, you, I think the data show that judges after lunch are like 70% more likely to grant parole. It's like it's... Whether or not the judge is hungry is a, more, is a bigger determinant of whether or not you get parole than what you've done. It's really quite, it's really quite funny, you know, unless you're up for parole. <laughs> Harsher moral judgments can even be induced following the consumption of a bitter drink, because people are often disgusted by bitterness. In addition, the same disgust-related facial expressions are observed in response to unpleasant tastes, disgusting photographs, and receiving unfair treatment in an economic game. So our sense of justice, that's a weird thing. Our sense of justice seems to be, who would guess that, eh? That it's, that it's, that it's centered in our, you know, from a biological perspective in, in the systems that mediate disgust. So I've seen this, you know, among people who've, who've received an injustice, you know. So, so something's been done to them that's not good. And they're often unable to let it go, partly because they're disgusted with themselves for not responding to it properly. It's like, you know, if someone throws a dart at you, and then it's like you have a moral obligation to respond to that, right? And you can think about it as anger or something like that, but part of it also seems to be that you're ashamed if you don't respond. And you can see that sort of thing happening in cultures of honor, you know, where if, if purity is violated, you see these in these situations where, you know, a father maybe kills his daughter, which happens reasonably often because she's violated some sort of social norm. Part of the idea is that, well... You know, if you don't respond harshly to something that's associated with disgust, then you bring dishonor on your entire family and maybe on your entire community. And, you know, we don't like that sort of thinking in the West, but, well, but the reasons that we don't approve of that sort of thinking, we think it's because we're liberal, but I think the evidence suggests that the reason that we don't approve of those sorts of behaviors is because we live in a very clean environment and we have plumbing. And so there's all sorts of things that we do that reduce the probability that we're going to be contaminated by parasites or infectious diseases. And so that means that we don't feel that it's necessary to respond as harshly to moral transgressions. And, you know, you might think, well, I doubt it. But let me show you the evidence because it's, it's unbelievable. Concerns about cleanliness and feelings of disgust have likewise been related to political attitudes. Situational reminders of the importance of physical cleanliness such as asking participants to wipe their hands with antiseptic wipes, tends to increase self-reported political conservatism. Such a finding is consistent with the notion that purity tends to be valued more by conservatives than by liberals. 
Individuals who report being disgusted more easily also tend to hold more conservative political views on topics including abortion, gay marriage, tax cuts, and affirmative action. In addition to the effects that have emerged when using self-report disgust sensitivity, more conservative political views have also been associated with stronger physiological reactivity to disgusting images. We found that conservatives are not only more aroused by disgusting stimuli, they're more aroused by any stimuli. Happiness, hunger, fear, you name it. It affects the conservative more than the liberal. And then we've also found that if you put, you take undergraduates and you expose them to videos that induce various physiological states, happiness, sadness, fear, disgust, and then we also ask people how long it was since they last ate. Well, if you put people in one of those emotional or motivational states and then you show them political speeches, the more emotional they are, or the hungrier, the more they like conservative speeches. So that was actually very interesting. So, a large literature has converged on the notion that there are two core dimensions of conservative political ideology. Resistance to change and tolerance of inequality. Okay. Resistance to change reflects the extent to which people wish to maintain the status quo, while tolerance of inequality reflects the acceptance of an unequal distribution of resources and opportunities within society. You know, and so there's the sort of the idea that the best rise to the top, and the best is a moral judgment, and the top is the right place for the best people to be. And then you might ask, well, why is the top the best? I mean, why do we assume that the, 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 the top of a dominance hierarchy is the right place to be? Well, part of it is, of course, that the closer you are to the top of a dominance hierarchy, especially if you're male, the more likely it is that you're going to you know, um, be attractive to, to people of the opposite sex, so there's, that's partly it. But then this other thing seems to be, well, it's actually a better, it is a better place to be at the top because it's, it's cleaner and safer and there are more resources there. And so that accounts at least in part for the judgment of the people who are at the bottom of the hierarchy. So these two dimensions appear roughly aligned with social and economic conservatism as expressed in the constructs of right-wing authoritarianism and social dominance orientation, respectively, which, which you can measure hypothetically with questionnaires. So, these core facets of conservatism are also closely related to two higher order value dimensions described in moral foundations theory, which reflect preferences for order and tradition on the one hand and preferences for egalitarianism on the other. Okay, so we'll, we'll leave that part. Political conservatism can thus be thought of as a social immune system reflecting the extension of pathogen avoidance mechanisms to the integrity of the social system. Just as the behavioral immune system has been conceptualized as helping to maintain the purity and integrity of an individual body, so too may the same pathogen avoidance system help to maintain the abstract integrity of the social order. In particular, the social immune system would help to maintain order by suppressing any actions or individuals that deviate from a group's accepted social traditions. So, it has been reported, for instance, that regions with higher levels of disease preference, prevalence tend to be associated with higher levels of social conformity and autocratic rule. Individuals who feel more vulnerable to disease likewise report higher levels of ethnocentrism and xenophobia. Such basic concerns about pathogen avoidance may thus contribute to the desire for order and tradition among conservatives, along with the harsh moral judgments associated with violations of the social order. 